the Agile Manifesto serves as our guidelines. It helps us when it comes to decision making into how we do things. If there are any questions into how we run stuff, we check against Agile values, the Agile principles. Are we doing the right thing? So that's what guides us as coaches, uh, as Scrum Masters, to help the dude run Agile. There are two other important guiding principles or concepts that we ensure that the folks at the dude understand. Number one, MVX. So we take the minimum viable product concept and took it a step further. The X stands for everything, minimum viable everything. So when we look into how we build product, for example, uh, our architecture is designed in such a way that we're not going to build anything that is that is not needed. So minimum, iterative, right? So the concept and the guiding principles for our developers and for architects to think in terms of that. Let's not build everything that we can think of. Let's build the stuff that is needed for us to support the product that the client uses. Only the stuff that has value. So minimum viable everything. Number two, the fog. Imagine you're driving in a fog. Things that is far away, you can't really tell. And as things get closer to you, you know, you see the shape coming, the shape forming, and eventually you see what it is. So the fog is something that we use in terms of how we look at planning. Things that are far away, we don't know. We can't estimate. We don't know what it looks like. Things that are closer to us, we know that. So using the concept of the fog, we created rolling plants. So we know the stuff that is nearest to us because we have to work on it. It's been refined. Things that are further away, we don't know. So there's no reason to go refine those because things can change. So that's how we use the concept of the fog. So a lot of us use the word the fog. It's in the fog, therefore we don't need it now. Is it in the fog? Has the fog clear yet? So we see we use that concept a lot. So those are the two additional concepts or guiding principles that we talk about and we ensure that our developers understand. What framework do you use at the dude? If you look into the Agile framework, there's a lot of those that's out there. So this Agile framework umbrella, the framework umbrella, if you've heard this term before, you know what it is. So there's Scrum, Kanban, XP, Safe, Less, DAD, a lot of this framework that's out there. We do not follow any one specific framework or we don't take on and adopt one entire framework. If there is any framework that we use the most, it will be Scrum. This is what we call the Agile Donut. The reason why we call it Agile Donut is the dough for the donut is Agile. So that makes how we do things. The donut is a shape of a circle, kind of like scrum. So agile donut. But why donut? It could be anything else. Now, the donut itself, imagine that. What's your favorite donut? Mine is chocolate. Yours could have sprinkles. It could have, you know, bacon, for example. It could have a bunch of things that's, that's as toppings on there. So what we do is that we take and look at different frameworks and take the parts that solve a problem for us. For example, we are organized uh, following the Spotify model. There's a component of safe that we have borrowed. Agile Donut is not a framework. It's just how we do work here. It allows us to grow, it allows us to change, and it's dynamic. Because guess what? If 
we have themes that run Kanban. So that's not Scrum, not in the shape of a donut, but that could be the donut holes, for example. So that's how we see things. And over time, as we evolve, we know that it will change because what so the solution that we have in play today may not work uh, in the future. Over 90% of our teams run Scrum. We follow pretty closely to the Scrum Guide. I would say 90% of it. So we do all the ceremonies, spring planning, we do daily stand-up, we do spring review, we do a retrospective, and we do backlog refinement. Backlog refinement has just recently been added to the Scrum Guide. So we do all five of those things. We have a product owner per team. The one thing that we don't have today is a Scrum Master to a team. We are more similar to Spotify where we have coaches. So we have Agile Coach that has two or three teams. We value self-organization a lot. So we coach our teams to be very self-organized. So how are we organized? We follow the Spotify model of organizing our teams. So our teams are called squads. A squad consists of seven plus minus two developers. Squad members are usually D-shaped developers. So we have people that can do full stack and those individuals also have certain domain expertise and we recognize that. And the way that we help that is that we have, we also adopted the concept of the chapter. The chapter is a cross cutting across multiple squads where individual from or with the same domain experts are grouped together. Now this is not a team that gets built, this is cross cutting. So for example, if you imagine the traditional functional teams that we had before, you have QA teams, right? So we have a QA chapter. QA chapter consists of squad members from different squads, right? Individuals from different squads that they specialize on QA automation, for example. They then meet regularly, once a week, and they have their own backlog. So they take care of ensuring that as a group of individuals, as a group of squads, we are all moving in the same direction, we're adopting the same standards, we're using the right tools to solve the problem. That is where our most of our technical debt stories come from, are from the chapters. So how many chapters do we have? We have a QA chapter, we have front-end chapter, back-end chapter, UX chapter, database chapter. So regularly these meetings happen, they have their backlog, they refine the backlog, they then take these stories and present it to the prop owner and provide the value as to why we need to do things. So that's the chapter. Now the collection of squads are called tribes. The way we see tribe is that this is a collection of squads or individuals that work on the same platform. So they have dependencies, very highly dependent. So anything that gets touched, for example, uh, we're all working using the same backend, uh, the same platform. Any changes that one developer does is gonna affect the other one. So that's a tribe. So for example, our co-located teams are called the Dude Platform Tribe. And then we have others as well. So that's how we are organized. We organize very closely to how Spotify organized as well. Now we do not take everything from Spotify, we only took what works for us.
how do we get work to the team? How do we feed them? AKA, we all know the terms planning. How does work flow from high level all the way down to the spring level? So I'm taking it from the top down. So at the level, at the higher level that we have today is that we have what's called a roadmap planning. Roadmap planning, the cadence for roadmap planning right now is every two sprints. And we and that is on a Monday at nine o'clock in the morning, a group of people consists of the product owner, architects, a rep senior representation, uh, kind of like technical lead people will be on there, uh, UX representation, the coaches are there, the directors and managers are there. At this roadmap planning, we look out. So every time we meet, we look at the work that is enough for four quarters. So we look at four quarters. Remember the concept of the fork. It is a rolling plan. Each time we meet, we add more onto the roadmap to ensure that we always have four quarters worth of work. So slowly it moves forward. The, the work that we talk in the, talk about in there are mostly epics. So epics are kind of our largest uh, work that, that we use at the dude. In this roadmap planning, we size them. So the product owner will present the work. We talk about it size them and then we put the individual epics into the quarter by squads so we line them up figure out where they will work how they will fall and we talk about which team which squad will have to work and kind of line up to see where we want things to, uh, to be done based on the business requirement so again this is a forecast right this is a forecast to help us plan. How do we size this? It's relative sizing. So we started with saying, okay, a small is, you know, let's make a guess. It's one to two springs, a medium running three to five, for example, uh, and a large is uh, six and, and, and above. So we started this process three years ago where we made a guess. Now, over time, what we did do is that when we break down stories, we tie them to the epics. The stories have story points. So we collected all the story points and sum them up, add them up for the epic for its size. So for example, a small, if there are 10 smalls, we have 10 data points on how many story points they are. So we can use this data to say, on average, we run X number of points for a small and since we we have the data in terms of how many points we can run per squad and we take a really high level generalization across all the squads that are in the tribe they for some reason they are interesting enough they tend to run about the same so when you and you don't have to do anything we did not do and say hey you must follow this team or follow that we let them decide how they want to run story points each squad has their own Story points, they're on the sizing is different, but interesting enough, they generalize among the uh, five, six different teams that we have today. So we took that, we said, okay, on average, we know that you know a small now runs one or two sprints because you can take the data and say, okay, small is 10 points, for example, uh, and a sprint is 10 points on general, at a general level, right? So from there, you can relate it back to say, okay, well, on Average is small is one spring. So then using that data, using historical data, it allows us to readjust how we do sizing and estimations uh, and putting them into the quarter to see how they fit at the roadmap level. So if we know a small is a sprint, we know that in a quarter there is six sprints, for example. So from there you can have six smalls. So that's kind of a real easy way quick way for us to get better at planning the next level below the roadmap planning is psi planning safe 2.0 has psi 
Today is called PI. PSI stands for Potentially Shippable Increments. So when we adopted this, it was SAFE 2.0. And that's a while back. So now it's like SAFE 4.5, I think is the latest one. So it's called PI today. So there's no difference, right? The terminology stuck with us because it meant something for us. Because what we're doing is that at every sprint, there is a potential for us to ship. We can ship at the end of the sprint. So potentially shippable increments, right? So you look at those increments. So what does PSI look like for us? So PSI planning, the cadence is the same as the roadmap. It's every two springs right now, and it's on a Tuesday morning. PSI is where all the squads get together. It starts with the PO coming up front, laying out the roadmap for every individual squad. So that came up from roadmap, right? So our roadmap, we have established the next four quarters worth of work for the squad, for each individual squad. We then ask the squad to say, awesome squad. At PSI, we look out six sprints. So we meet every two sprints to ensure that we have always have a six sprints worth of work in the pipeline. And what that means is that the team will take the information from the roadmap that the PO talked about, the PO presented, and then try to break them down. So this is work break, work breakdown at this point. So we break them down into smaller chunks, following along with the, the concept of the fog, we know that anything that is close to us, so for example, the, the spring that is coming up and the one falling, for example, most of the stickies at that point when we break them up, it's already stories. And those stories are already refined. When we do backlog refinement, we try to ensure that we have about two to three springs ahead of work that is refined. Anything outside of that uh, to us has no value because things will change. So imagine this, they're getting together to, to ha create six sprints worth of work. So similar like the concept of the fork, anything that's close, we really know what they are. Anything's far away, it's just a guess. So when it comes to spring number four, five, and six, most of the time it is just a rough breakdown and that's what's gonna help our PO to create the story. That's BSI. PSI lasts about two hours. Very short, very fast. And all this information is available on our PSI board. Out of the PSI planning, we have work now laid out for the next experience. This information is gonna be used to fit into backlog refinement and then into spring planning and then we execute on the sprint. So this is a rolling plan for us from roadmap to PSI planning, now down to spring planning. So it all interconnect. Now, one of the things that happens also is that, for example, doing roadmap planning, we assume certain things. We say, okay, this work is in this order. When we present it to the squads at PSI level, they may look and say, hey, guess what? If we were to shift things around a little bit, and if another squad will take this and we will take this, for example, we can get it done faster. And that has happened. So that's the nice thing about this is that when we allow our squads to look at the roadmap stuff, they can help us adjust. And that's one thing nice about this is that now information flows back. So now we get to adjust our roadmap. The roadmap and the PSI serves as a form of communication also for the rest of the organization. An example, a salesperson has a specific feature that they want. Question number one, is it on the roadmap? If it's on the roadmap, that means the business value the work, there is big value in the work, therefore it gets prioritized and it's in the roadmap. 
If not, it's further out away, right? Nobody knows whether it's gonna be on or not. So if it's if it made on the roadmap, it's a a year out. Since we meet regularly every month, every two springs, that gets updated. So we can see the progress of the feature that has been requested and see when is it coming. Now as things change, of course, then you can see that. The other indicator is, is it on the PSI board? If it made it on the PSI board, that means it's coming up in this quarter. It's in the next quarter, for example. So PSI board is six sprints, right? That's one quarter. So that's kind of how work is. So for us, if you look at our board, work kind of comes from the bottom and it slowly raises up. If it goes up, then the feature is done. That, so that's how we interpret the board. So that information can be used by our salesperson, uh, by people walking by, stakeholders to see where things are done. The more teams that we have, the harder it is to communicate. So Scrum for a team is fairly easy because there is less communication, there is less dependency outside of one team. Now you have multiple teams working together in a tribe, now the challenge is how do you communicate with each other to ensure that you don't forget stuff, you don't stump over somebody else, you don't overwrite somebody else's code, and to ensure that we're all working on the same direction. And to help us with that, we look at Scrum or Scrum. Scrum or Scrum has the concept of where the Scrum Master acts as the communicator. And SAFE does this too. Right. Safe, Safe has the same thing where the train engineer, for example, right? So the Scrum Master talks to the train engineer to make sure that if things are, you know, if, if the, the train is running in the right direction. There's one thing that we believe in is that the person that is doing the work has the most information. So therefore, they should be the one doing the communications and not be a third person that's relaying the communi communication, relaying the information and make the wrong and provide the wrong information. So we created this concept of squad captains. Every squad has a captain. The captain acts as the communicator for the squad. And they provide information out and they bring information in. Scrum is easy for one team, for one squad. When you have multiple squads, it is important that we all stay communicated on the same thing. We stay on the same communication path. So communication is very critical to the success when it comes to multiple squads. And usually if we fail on communication, then uh, we have the issues of dependency where things are broken, where you know people get mad at each other because somebody else or somebody else is going. So how do we facilitate that? At the end of spring planning, we have what's called cross-squad planning. So for cross-squad planning, all the squads come back and they talk about, for this coming sprint, we are planning to do X, Y, and Z. Every squad comes up and everybody is there in this planning. It gives individuals from different squads to see if there are any work that could interfere with what they plan to do. And they will call it up, for example, hey, when you guys are working on X, make sure you let us know because we're working on Y and there is a dependency there. Or maybe, hey, why don't you, can you guys hold off on X well, until we finish Y? So there's this communication that goes on, that this negotiation and planning goes on at cross court planning. At the end of the daily stand-up, so daily stand-up is for individual squats. Once they are done, we have what's called a cross squat stand-up. Cross squad stand up is where the captains represent the squad. They get together and they stand in front of this, what we call our cross squad board. On this board, there are stickies on there. The stickies has color. The color represent the different squads. The rows are the different layers of work, the APIs. The common APIs, the APIs that we all use in that one tribe, 
and the columns is basically backlog in progress and done. This is a simple common board. So the stick is moved throughout the sprint. And every day at the end of the list, stand up, there is a cross squad stand up where the captains get together, they go over the board and say where things are, which squad is working on which one, uh, to facilitate, to ensure that we're communicating uh, among ourselves, among the squads. So that's cross squad stand up. So those are two things that we put in place, borrowing from the concept of Scrum and Scrum to help us communicate. So that is cross squad planning, cross squad stand up. So in Scrum, we have retro, retrospective. So the retrospective ceremony enable a Scrum team to look at what they could do to get better at running as a squad. So that affects the team health. How healthy is the team? So the retrospective help the squad team to do better. Since we have so many squads, how do we work together as a tribe? How do we get better as a tribe? So we take on the same concept. So we have this, what's called tribe retro. So tribe retro is where the captains, again, representing the squads now, coming together with the managers, with the coaches, um, representing from the UX, uh, get together and say, hey, you know, a very typical retro way in the last month. So our cadence is every month. We get together for about an hour and a half. What do we do well? What do we go well? Uh, that's one of the format we use. How can we better? So that helps us as a tribe to be, uh, to reflect and improve uh, as a tribe. The other things that we have is what's called a tribe gathering. Tribe gathering is where more of a, a come together, a meeting, and it's where information is passed down. So usually you got the directors, uh, the managers coming, uh, an architect, for example, talking about what's coming up, uh, talking about company changes, talking about company updates, uh, in terms of health, you know, what have we done? How can we better? So we provide those information downwards. Uh, so that's from management uh, coming down. So that, that's a tribe gathering. That is how we do Agile Attitude. The components in play, the learnings that we've had, the adjustment that we have to do, it's all in it. There are more, obviously, than the stuff that I've talked about. Uh, those are just the, what I would call the skeleton or the, uh, the backbone of the Agile Donut. Um, hiring the right people is also key. Uh, support from management is also key. Thank you.